It happened again. I had another awkward encounter with an author. Hey book buddies, I'm Eric from Lonesome Reader. I am so glad that January is over. It's just been like a, such a bleak month overall. Like I, and I've just been dealing with it by burying myself in reading lots, like for the most part. Like I, I found at the beginning of the month and I don't know if this ever happens to you, but like after making all these resolutions and like ideas of things I wanna do in the new year, I just have this thing where I shut down. It's like that self-imposed pressure causes me to rebel and I just spent a day or two at the beginning of this month uh, just getting drunk and eating lots of junk food and playing video games and just laying around like a big old slug doing nothing productive or positive or worthwhile. But then I just snapped out of it and it's like, right, let's go. And I've been reading lots. I read uh, 10 books in total in all and uh, like really liked most of them and even loved some of, the, some of them. And one I really didn't like in the end. And like I said, I went to see one of these authors read and then embarrassed myself when I went to get my book signed. Uh, I made this video a few months ago uh, about awkward encounters with authors. Uh, so here's another one to add to the list. When will I ever learn? Uh, but I'll talk about that more in a few minutes. So the first book I read in 2018 was this novel, Sisters, by Lily Tuck. Uh, who I've never read Lily Tuck before, and like to be honest, I've never really heard of her before, um, even though she's published several novels and she's won the National Book Award. Her style, uh, in this book at least, is really sparse, sort of pared down prose uh, that still pack a big punch. This is all about a woman who becomes somewhat obsessed with her husband's ex-wife and it's so strange when you think about this relationship we have with our, our partners, our, our like lover, lovers or our wives or our husbands, and we think about their, their ex-partners and, and how um, our like relationship with them, like we've shared the most like intimate space with this, this person that, that we w live with and we love, uh, but you know, we, we don't really, you have this in common with, with their exes, but you, generally don't really know their exes unless it happens that they really get along with them. And this novel explores that odd relationship where uh, we begin to discover how little we might actually know about our partner and how little we know about ourselves. It's really impactful for such a short novel and the writing is really like fast paced and modern. Um, it sort of reminded me of Jenny Offal's Department of Speculation, if you read that book, or more recently Rachel Kahn's novel, uh, Goodbye Vitamin. Then I read this uh, longish uh, thriller mystery type novel called uh, Girl in the Snow by Dania Kukafka. And like I said in my um, recent like January book haul, uh, the, I think January is a really good time for like thrillers or mysteries or that sort of genre. And this novel is only a thriller in the sense that it begins with uh, the, the discovery of a body of a teenage girl in a small like sleepy suburban town. Uh, but it's really more about the lives of three different outsiders, um, two teenagers and a cop. So story-wise it has a sort of Twin Peaks type feel but, but it's not so surreal as that. It gets these characters feelings of alienation in a really raw and creative way. Like one of the characters, Jade, uh, she imagines uh, scenes from her life as like film scripts, like, like how she wishes that they could play out, but then in reality she's just like a sulky and sarcastic teenager. So I thought this novel was really effective and enjoyable. Next, poof, I read this explosive novel, Fire Sermon by Jamie Quattro, and I've been anticipating this novel so much um, since I saw the author read from it a couple of months ago at an event, and uh, she, she read from it so well and it, it sounded so intriguing. And also um, the novel was really enthusiastically endorsed by Garth Greenwell, whose novel uh, What Belongs to You I love so much. And it really makes sense that he would connect with it so strongly because like he did in his novel, A Fire Sermon gets at the like complexities of desire in such a powerful way. This story is about a woman reflecting back on a significant affair that she had in her life, and it, that story's been done a lot before, uh, but Jamie Quattro writes about it in a way which feels so meaningful and fresh, and it becomes this sort of like spiritual quest to like 
discover herself or, or understand uh, the relationship that we have with ourselves. The degree to which we care for or neglect ourselves, uh, the ways in which we stay in touch with uh, what we need or the way that we like deny how we're changing in life and how our needs are changing over time. This is such a profound book and in case you didn't see it, uh, Matthew Sharapa also made a video uh, talking about this book in such an awesome way, uh, so I'll link that below. So one of my reading goals uh, for this year was to read a book of poetry and a book of short stories every month. And so uh, the first book of poetry that I've started with is this book, uh, Don't Call Us Dead by Denise Smith. And I'd heard so many good things about this book uh, when it was first published in America last year. So I've been waiting for it to be published in the UK um, and it's uh, just finally been published here. Uh, Jen Campbell listed it as uh, one of her favorite books um, that she read last year. Poetry can sometimes feel alienating and like hard to understand, uh, but these poems are so immediately relatable and have a real emotional urgency to them. They speak about the experience of being an African American, of being a black gay man, of uh, being a HIV positive black gay man. They're about the vulnerability of black bodies in America today. Uh, some of the poems seem to be playing off from the Black Lives Matter movement. But the poems are also filled with humor and delight and anger and sensuality. And one poem had me crying on the train as I was going home from work. I loved this book so much. And so I went to see Denez give a reading at a event in London, uh, which was so exciting, uh, like particularly because um, he was also reading alongside uh, this other um, poet called uh, Jay Bernard, who I went on a um, writing retreat with her like about like 10 years ago or so, and so like newer from like way back. Um, so I was so excited to see them both. And this reading was one of the most powerful I think I've ever seen an author give. Like um, both um, Denez and Jay's readings were filled with like so much energy and passion. Everyone in the audience was reacting to the poems. And so after I went to get my book signed and I was like, right, be cool just to say that you love the book and you love the reading and, and that's fine, that's all you need to say. And so I queued up and when I got to the front of the queue, I just sort of froze and I like stood there and I didn't even like hold my book out for him to sign it. And he was just like, hi, how are you? And I was like, fine, how are you? And he said, I'm good, okay. And then I just, leapt into like action and like handed in my book and was like, like oh, I, I love this book so much and, and I thought your reading was so powerful. And then I thought to myself, like uh, you should say something funny because uh, that always works out. And so um, I said like, oh, your, your poem Vaseline was a particular highlight. He has this poem called Vaseline, uh, which he talked about some of the poems in this book are just gratuitously sexual. And uh, Vaseline is one of those poems. Um, it's about his like adolescent self when he discovered uh, that Vaseline can be used as a tool um, in self-pleasure. And, uh, but, but actually it's also like a really moving poem because he also talks about how this same tub of Vaseline is used by his, his mother who rubs it on her face. And, and so it sort of gets at that whole weird intimate dynamic of family life. Anyway, he chuckled when I said that I liked that poem about Vaseline. And then like uh, stupidly, I thought like, like you, you should say something else about Vaseline. <laughs> and uh, I was like panicked, like, oh, what else can I say about Vaseline? <laughs> and um, then I remembered um, this video um, that I saw on YouTube featuring Tyra Banks um, from an uh, incident from her talk shows where she gives all of her audience Vaseline and she cries about it and the audience just goes like crazy because they've all got these tubs of Vaseline. It's just so hilarious and absolutely absurd. It's this video that Matthew Sharapa sent to me um, that, that was just, it's just so funny. And so here I am with this writer whose poems brought me to tears, but I'm just babbling on about this Tyra Banks video in uh, such a ridiculous way. And he's looking at me sort of confused and he says, I've never seen that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's so great. Like you, you should look it up. <laughs> oh. And in my mind, I'm saying like, shut up, Eric. Uh, but of course I didn't. I just kept babbling on about Tyra Banks. Uh, but so that was awkward and silly. Uh, but I got my book signed and he wrote that I should be a dangerous seed.
So I finished reading this memoir, non-fiction type book, uh, David Seabrook's All the Devils Are Here, uh, which has such a tactilely satisfying cover and it's so beautifully designed and it has these like poisonous pastel colors. And it's an odd one because it gives such fascinating tidbits of information about um, the, these forgotten histories of these British seaside towns with murders and Charles Dickens' final novel and fascists and T.S. Eliot going insane and uh, a camp film star of the Carry On films living in drunken isolation. And the author strives to make connections between things uh, which is often really interesting. But throughout the book there's this feeling that the author himself is in some sort of personal crisis and is very lonely, but he never opens up to the reader about what that is. Uh, so I was left feeling a bit like disappointed or like I'd been left shortchanged and it partly inspired me to make uh, that recent video about uh, why I might review a book negatively. And I think this is a great example of an author not fulfilling his potential and purposefully withholding from the reader. He actually like writes this at one point um, where he says, uh, let's face it, there are things I haven't mentioned, private matters, they're on me all day long. And you can really feel that he wants to say something but he doesn't trust himself to open up for some reason. And that's so frustrating for a reader and I don't know like why it is, like it might just be like a British thing, like sort of his British demeanor, he doesn't want to talk about these emotional things or you could argue that like he, he says a lot more by with, withholding or by just writing an outline of his despair. Uh, but for me this book was like a failure, although like, it, like I said there, there are some like really interesting things about it um, in these histories that he goes into. The House of Impossible Beauties by Joseph Kassara. I buddy read this with Matthew Sharapa and I, I, keep, I keep talking about Matthew Sharapa, don't I? But like, how can I not? He's, he's such a wonderful friend. So this novel is all about the formation of the first all Latino drag house in New York City in the 1980s. It's been years since I saw the amazing documentary Paris is Burning, uh, which records that whole scene, that whole era of like drag houses and drag balls and competitions. And some of the queens that appear in that documentary are fictionally recreated in this novel, like Miss Venus Extravaganza. So while it's all about glitz and glamour and fashion and <laughs> it's also about family rejection and AIDS and habitual drug use and queens dangerously pimping themselves out on the notorious docks in New York City. And I love how he brings the whole culture to life with language uh, heavily inflected with Spanish. So he, he, he uses words uh, like palitos and jodienda, perna, chicle, pendeja, mocos. And he has a fantastically fluid way of using pronouns, like Matthew pointed this out as being something that's particularly good about the novel, that as the characters change to think about themselves as male or female, the narrative follows suit um, with those pronouns, which is so clever and awesome. So I mostly really enjoyed this novel, uh, but I did like feel a little like shortchanged at some points, like there's, there's only one scene that actually portrays a, a drag ball scene. Um, and, and I thought there would be more of that. It's, it's more about the, the characters' individual lives, um, which are like fascinating and really interesting to follow. And the story does become unrelentingly grim at some points in that kind of a little life sort of way. I mean there's a lot of humor and sisterhood and moments of beauty as well. And it's hard to think of a way that Kassara could have got around the, the bleakness of, of these stories because like a lot of the, the queens from this period in history like their, their lives ended in tragedy. But it gave an overwhelmingly somber feeling sometimes. However, like overall, I thought this was a really powerful and excellent novel. I read Alice McDermott's novel, The Ninth Hour, because this was on a lot of like the best books of the year lists um, at the end of last year. And like Lily Tuck, McDermott is an author that I've never read before, even though she's like really well regarded. So this is a really quiet, moving novel that begins with a suicide and then it follows the struggles of his wife and child 
um, and the way that uh, this group of nuns support them. It's really beautifully written and it captures that personal dilemma of like, how much do you want to give of yourself um, to help other people and to give back to the world? So it portrays these nuns' lives in a really complex way, like some of them are very progressive and others are very conservative. And it centers around the decision of the child of whether she wants to follow in their example or sort of strike out on her own. So I was really engaged by this novel and enjoyed it. Danny Denton is Ireland's hot new writer and The Early King and The Kid in Yellow is his debut novel. Uh, so this is a proof copy, uh, but this is what the final version looks like. I can't remember feeling so caught up in the atmosphere of a novel like I did reading this book. It's so creative in its structure because it depicts this kind of post-apocalyptic type landscape of Ireland uh, where it just rains constantly. There are pages that are literally coated in rain and then there are other sections like a damp manuscript of a play. So it's this overwhelming feeling of dampness and society has broken down to the point where it's uh, basically being run by this gang and the leader of this gang is called the Early King. One of the young runners of his gang falls in love with the king's daughter and they have a baby together and to try to save the baby from the negative influence of this gang leader, uh, he steals the baby away. So it's this gripping uh, chase and detective story, uh, but there's so much in it about like literature and poetry and the limits of our information age. It's really powerful and fascinating and so creatively done. And I read another big epic called Kintu or Chintu, I think is the proper pronunciation. Sean the Book Maniac um, corrected my pronunciation and I, I tried to look it up but I, I couldn't find any like definitive answer about how it should be pronounced. Like I tried to, to look up videos of the author herself talking about it um, but but I uh, couldn't find one where she actually pronounces the name of the, the book. This is a Uganda family epic that starts in 1750 with a local leader named Chintu who has many wives and children, uh, but a curse is supposedly placed upon him and his family. And this curse becomes a legend. So when the novel uh, jumps forward many generations to the recent past, you see how this family is still being affected by the legend of this curse. This is a novel about different social attitudes in present day Uganda and about the way the past impacts upon the present. It's a really involved epic novel and the author's storytelling technique is so like gripping that I felt really drawn into several scenes in the book. And I'm a sucker for big family epics. Uh, although like in some points it did feel start to feel like a bit confusing, like even though at the beginning of the novel there um, it actually shows a family tree, uh, but like it's still sort of hard to follow some of the characters, like some of their characters' relationships with each other uh, because like a lot of them have like multiple names like uh, in sort of like big like Russian novels, like there's like triple barrel names and some of the characters have nicknames and a lot of the characters are twins and so it's difficult to follow sometimes the the family relationship between some of the characters. It's one of those novels that you really have to concentrate on and take your time with, but overall it is so good and like such an accomplishment. It's so great that this part of Uganda's history is being popularized and told, you know, like sort of like with the, the novel The House of Impossible Beauties. These are like communities that like aren't often represented in uh, literature. And finally, I read the book of short stories her Body and Other Parties. Uh, this was a finalist for the National Book Award and I think it might be up for some other book award, uh, but this book is extraordinary. These stories are so creative and absurd and play with gender in such a fascinating way. There's a story about a woman who makes a list of lovers amidst a like deadly disease that's decimating society and another story about a couple who create this like fictional child in a sort of who's afraid of Virginia Woolf type way, but the child might be real. There's a story that gives summaries of the many episodes and seasons in this existential detective uh, TV show, uh, which is totally fictional. There's a story about how 
women start vanishing and their souls become sort of trapped in these designer dresses. Many are about lesbian relationships and women's complicated relationships with their bodies. They're really wild and invigorating to read and I just loved them. So that's my reading month. I've, I've gone on way too long now so thank you for watching if you've made it this far. Let me know your thoughts about any of these books or if you have any questions or if you're particularly keen to read any of them now. Links to my full reviews are in the description below. Happy reading book buddies and I'll speak to you again soon.